Happy Griftmas! Yay! It's the Great Griftmas Day. Anyway, um, I thought that we'd look at a little bit of the Great Fence-Sitter. The man who will not take a side. The man who says, nay, to other gods like, are you with me? And the Jews are like, the Lord is or God. Or God is the Lord. I don't know. There's that scene in, you know, Ten Commandments. Anyway... This is Anthony Stein, good friend of those who refuse to take a position. <sighs> All right, let's let him open the video. Good morning. It is Thursday, December 14th, 2023. Making sure I get the year right, unlike yesterday. And we are talking today about Francis sending everybody mm -hmm. signals that he believes his time is almost up and or at least that he doesn't have that much time left and again i'm going to preface this by saying i am not celebrating the potential um end of francis's time on this in this mortal coil i have repeatedly told people not to do not to celebrate such things but instead if you have that inclination instead turn that inclination into a desire to pray fervently for the salvation of his soul and all the rest of the things that we as catholics are supposed to do what? Why are we praying for the salvation of someone who is so dagnasty evil? It kind of reminds me of uh, this video. Let's hear what the immortal Father Chicada has to say about this. You can now see with your own eyes and hear with your own ears the poisonous modernist heresies of Vatican II, incarnate in the person of Jorge Mario Bergoglio. He is destroying Catholic faith. He is mm -hmm. destroying Catholic morality for untold millions of souls now and for centuries to come. Mm -hmm. As such, he is no mere bad dad mm -hmm. with an unused infallible stamp in his back pocket. Still less is he the vicar of Christ. He is the vicar of the devil. <laughs> yes, he is the vicar of the devil. So why are we praying for the vicar of the devil? Oh, well, let's get back to Mr. Stein. You know, man who believes in to pray for the devil. He's probably like, <laughs> maybe if I pray hard enough, Eve still won't get the apple. Pray, <laughs> Which is not to say, I know the counter argument is when we see evil defeated, the mm -hmm. Bible even says we are permitted to cheer. <gasps> yeah. That having been said, while a hundred percent true, it's still good to prepare for the repose for his soul while he still has time, because our Lord commands us to pray for everybody, our enemies included. <gasps> Wait a second. Did he just call his Pope, his infallible guide to heaven, the man who he believes is Pope, in enemy oh that sounds awful shady the contest of you we're to pray for our neighbors for our loved ones and for our enemies that means we're supposed to pray for everybody and especially mm -hmm. for somebody with as high a stature in the world and allegedly in the church as him wait allegedly in the church you're saying of a contest but instead he's the great fencer how how do you have an allegedly in the church this is like a canonical thing like Either you were baptized and there's witnesses, there has to be witnesses. So this is like probably the most political BS I've heard in quite a while. Allegedly, Sadie Picante is a saint. Allegedly. Allegedly, Sadie Picante makes a million dollars a year and is hot and single and ready to mingle. Allegedly. Is this all a joke? Or are we really at the um, level of saying allegedly for everything? All right, so the context for the next clip is after saying hi to his thousands of allegedly paying, paying subscribers who buy him exactly 27 ounces of coffee a day. And not talking about some cheap Starbucks coffee here. No, I'm talking about that Himalayan monkey coffee, which goes for $500 a cup, allegedly. Yes. Francis gave his 37th general audience recently. And so I want to frame everything he says here with some of his imparted words of, I guess you could call it wisdom, he says, he says if we don't live in the spirit, whatever that means, we are ideologues mm -hmm. and we don't have the gospel. Mm. I'll show you his address, the, the, the relevant section of his address here. From his address, we get this. 
quote, Pope Francis concluded his zeal of catechesis on the theme, the passion for evangelization, the apostolic zeal of the believer. In the 30th and final catechesis, the Pope emphasized the importance of the liberating proclamation of the gospel beyond proselytism and remaining in the habitual. Beyond proselytism and remaining in the habitual. So in the life of Sede Picante, he plays lots of Japanese RPGs, real-time strategy. So if you knew Sede P personal, he'd probably try to convince you that playing computer games, writing music, or writing books is, you know, morally acceptable. It's something that normal people do. That is, he would try to proselytize you into his way of life. Not necessarily because he wants to change you, but he wants to change your mind. Because all human beings, in a sense, seek to justify themselves. So, how you get proselytism without, or remaining in habit without proselytism, for the way you live out your faith, is beyond me. I mean, allegedly, this guy is a human being who wrote this. Allegedly. Uh, human nature happens to work a certain way. Everyone justifies what they do. So, like, one of the, the weird things, he... I don't even know what the heck Francis is talking about. Don't convert people, but I want you to really be outwardly Catholic as much as possible. How does that work? So for this next clip, Mr. Stein will try to not laugh in or to not laugh at the text he is reading. This concerns every Christian, I repeat from the beginning. In fact, missionary zeal is not propaganda to gain approval or does it fill the head with ideas, but rather it ignites the spark of God's love in the heart. It's an odd phrase, isn't it? It does not fill the head with ideas. To paraphrase a fine phrase, the heart of those to whom we proclaim is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be kindled. Apostolic zeal does not depend on organization, but on zeal. It will not be measured by the approval we receive, but by the love we give. End quote. It's measured by the love we give? Is this a Disney movie? How about we measure it by the pain we suffer when we listen to Sede Picante, pretending he's very funny? How do you even read this stuff? Like, oh my goodness. I'm not even talking about Mr. Stein reading this. How do you, as like someone who believes this, read this? This is so weird. And now we have the gossip of the day. That Francis has told uh, told the world that he wants to be buried in St. Mary Major. Now, some people say, wow, well, that's a big symbolic thing. Maybe. He says his reasoning is he has a great devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, and that's where he wants to... Uh, uh, lion state at I guess you could say but he has a great devotion to the blessed virgin why don't we read some of the words of the Francis quote the church and the virgin Mary are mothers both of them what is said of the church can be said also of our lady and what is said of our lady can also be said of the church we, do we love the church as we love our mothers taking or also taking into account her defects all mothers have defects and we have and we all have defects but when we speak of mother's defects we gloss over them we love her as she is and the church also has her defects but we love her just as a, a mother do we help her to be more beautiful more authentic more in harmony with the lord close quote now those are two um the first quote part is taken from like the second sentence and the last one from like the third to last and that will be linked below. That's from Francis Church. Or Francis Church has flaws like Mary. That's very clear. That the allegedly Catholic man in white believes the church is just a natural institution tainted with sin. But not only does that deny the Immaculate Conception, which is kind of necessary to be a Catholic, but it also denies, um, denies the very substance of the church. So Nova Sorda Watch quoting things, right? Father Sylvester Berry, theologically, it is certain that the church must be holy in every respect. Hmm, that sounds like Francis really, really has a big devotion to the Blessed Virgin, man. He's, he's really gung-ho about that Marian stuff. Hmm. But even the church by itself, because of its marvelous propagation, its exceptional holiness, and its inexhaustible fruitfulness in all good works. Mm -hmm. That sounds like imperfect, um, fallen, weakened, wounded, sinful. Yep, yep, yep. That's what that sounds like. Nonetheless, 
She also within her bosom many members who are not who are not holy, who are, who afflict and persecute and misjudge her. And this is uh, Pius the Ninth is saying it's because the church is holy. She is holy in all that she does. That does not mean that she does not have the people within her who attack her. But that's a different issue. And my camera's dying. This might be the last year I have this camera. And the year's almost over. Oh, no, do, do, do. In fact, only a miracle of that divine power could preserve the church, the mystical body of Christ, from blemish and the holiness of her doctrine and laws, and end the midst of her flood of corruption and lapses of her members. And you see, you can just keep on going. There's more quotes. Sacred faith, she is holy, in fact. The very same church of God, which he has purchased with his blood. Certainly the loving mother is spotless in the sacraments, by which she gives birth and nourishes her children in faith. But it cannot be laid to her charge if some of her members fail, weak, or wounded. And this is, of course, will be linked below. So those are two very, very different attempts at theology of the church. And for, for you to say Francis likes the Blessed Virgin, I mean, <laughs> allegedly Sadie Picante has a Swiss bank account with millions of dollars. It, it, that's more believable than the uh, Francis is anything nice to think about the Blessed Virgin. And my camera's gone. We will just have the white there. So, in this next clip, Stein opines on how much time does Bergoglio have left. You can tell he's got not a lot of time, that he doesn't believe he has a lot of time, which he might be wrong about. I maintain that he's going to be there until 2025 or later. But 2025 or later, that's an interesting take. Because I don't really know a lot about this topic. I'm not going to um, really talk about it. But it is an interesting topic. Like, How long does the Bergoglio have? So now the Stein wants to talk about precedence. Mm, very interesting topic. Back to Benedict. But it's also a precedent. And in the next few days, you're going to hear me talk about things where I'm starting invoking the concept of a precedent. A precedent is an act done that can be used later to justify other things. Even uh, By the way, um, this was streamed two days ago as I record this on the 16th. And if done, that can be used later to justify other things, even if they aren't related. Um, one of these I'm going to give you here, uh, we'll talk about here briefly, is, uh, the, is what Cardinal Fernandez said recently about ashes and cremation and things. Practices Catholics have always been against until the 1990s when the door was cracked open just a little bit in the new version of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And now Fernandez is completely changed everything and he did it by aligning what the church's teaching is on this to secular norms he explicitly said to the rules of the civil authorities that is a precedent that will be used for all kinds of other things use your imagination on that i'll have a formal video on that for you probably saturday so this is why we i call anthony stein the great fence sitter hey look guys Oh, by the way, in this video, he uses this term, the hermeneutic of suspicion. I do think that he's used it before. But what it serves to do is we don't have the authority to say that Francis isn't the Pope. But he utilizes this interesting hermeneutic of suspicion to be able to just pretty much naysay anything that goes on. How does one have a perpetual suspicion of someone when that person publicly does not hold to the faith, the tradition, and here I'm merely speaking of the contents of the Catholic faith. Don't, it's not like we didn't have, or we, it's not like we have a hermeneutic of suspicion about everyone who is a true believer. We have a hermeneutic of suspicion for like, if you're a dodgy person. So to publicly say, hey, I've got a hermeneutic of suspicion about this guy. You, you gotta think, well, what did he do? Does he, is he carrying contraband? Does he have bad books in his pocket? Is he buying Bitcoin? Like, what's going on here? Like, we have a hermeneutic of suspicion in the real world, like for every single Novus Ordo Bishop, every single global initiative, every single president, every single senator. 
every secular authority that doesn't hold the Catholic faith. And then Anthony signs like, oh yes, and uh, also for the infallible head of our church, Pope Francis, uh, very suspicious of him. Um, uh, allegedly, Mr. Stein is a Catholic, and that's about as far as you can go. Like, there's no way to defend that, guys, guys. Treated. Remember, Ben? Oops. So, in this next clip, Mr. Stein ponders now about reducing our ceremonies. You know, because he pointed out that uh, Smoochie there was using worldly measures to make spiritual measures. So, if we're continuing to reduce our measures... Oh, look at this lovely picture Mr. Stein has. Hello, Mr. Stein. Um, if we're continuing to reduce our picture... Oh, wait, my camera's completely dead. Oh, well. If we... Anyway... Let's just play the clip. Benedict was, he uh, he liked to present himself in a much more traditional way. The the crimson shoes that he would wear, a lot of the majesty that he would bring to the papacy. But the only things he didn't do was wear a papal tiara, which had been abolished as a practice by Paul VI, or uh, ride the, uh, I don't remember what it's called, the the uh, the litter that they carry the Pope, in, that you would see preconciliar Popes carried in, where there would be several carriers who would pick him up and carry him literally above the heads of the other cardinals when they would meet in consistory. To my knowledge, he never uh, used one of those either. But other than those things, Benedict was very much in favor of a lot of the majesty and symbolism of the, of the papacy. And so when they did him dirty that way, so to speak, by taking away the traditional funeral that you would give a pope that was a precedent for what we're seeing now and francis is going to further simplify this and in so doing what you're going to see is that a pope is is going to in the future be given will be given funerals that are to have less pomp and circumstance than even that of a the president of, of a secular country by the way it's interesting to note who's in the live chat of his video but anthony Abate is actually in it which is funny <laughs> <laughs> Wait a second. Could it be that Anthony Stein is actually the same person as Anthony Abate? They're both named Anthony. And they produce their content for a very wide audience. Hmm, and then put out links to take money. And then my middle name is Anthony. Where am I going with this, you wonder? <laughs> There's nowhere. But his point is really kind of funny and really tragic. Like, you see the Pope is a monarch and he's treated merely as a president he's merely he's treated as one who presides over the state rather than one who is the state and this is a fundamental difference between the montini novus Ordo religion and the pope pius the 12th um catholic religion see the catholic pope is the state he is the magisterium the novus Ordo monarchs are just presidents they just happen to be the person on top of the food chain but they aren't the actual state so when nova sort of monarchs ha are being buried and now we're comparing it to a secular burial that's just it just seems normal there's nothing else you can really say about it it's just a tragedy of history and then you know he accepts it. Mr. Stein has to accept this because he's the great fence sitter and he has to believe that even though he's suspicious that this guy truly is the Pope somehow. Oh well. So I'll summarize the next point in the video. Francis is changing the rules which is causing more division. It is intended to solidify the Montini changes and toss out the JP2 Ratzinger changes. Someone I respect very much pointed out to me that the whole side altar of traditionalism is actually not the intention of the Nova Soto religion. The Nova Soto religion, its intention is to be ecumenical with the whole world. Past, present, and future, just not with the traditionalists. Just not with the Catholic faith. The thing the Nova Soto religion does not want to have, but currently finds itself having because of JP2 and Ratzinger, is the SSPX side altar. The little bit of traditionalists being snuck in. They don't want them, but they do want its members. Because there's something toxic in traditionalist values to the ec ecumaniacs. When I started this episode saying Francis is the vicar of the devil, what I mean is this. The Novus Ordo religion is a distinct religion with a head who sits on our papal throne, writing rules over canon law and performing evil rituals in front of our altars. He has to sit on our throne to keep us from occupying it. 
his legitimacy as a Novus Ordo priest is no better than any Protestant cleric, which itself is derived from legitimacy from the Holy Book of God, the Bible. Again, something which they do not possess but have stolen. Only the city of Acontis who hold the faith hold the entire are the real Catholics. My take on what Francis is up to is he has to create a false war where they will have the uh, traditionalists in the Novus Ordo, so the conservatives, and they will be fighting against the true face of the Novus Ordo religion, which is Montini and progressivism first. Neither are truly Catholic, but you see the setup. It's tempting to lure us into trying to defend the SSPX side altar instead of Sede Vicantism, which is for us to say uh, the entirety of the Novus Ordo religion is a falk, false hoax thing and has to be gotten rid of. So now let's go on to our favorite. Are we on Pints with Bush already? All right, let's go. Possibly the best thing we can do with the rest of our time today is... Listen to someone whose name is Richard de Clue. Context. Maybe not everything this guy says is dumb. Yes. Take it away, Pints with Aquinas. I, th I think sometimes we have this picture that the Catholic Church was great in the 1950s and early 60s and then Vatican II ruined everything. Yeah. But that's not the case. Okay. And if you, if you talk to people from that time period, they'll tell you that. Yeah. Um... I thought this was the greatest clip I've ever seen. This is, clip is so good that I want to replay it. Uh, this whole video was about making, it was doubling down on the myths of Vatican II, and there's so much juicy dumbness in this. I, I had to watch. I have to review it. So let's replay that. I, th I think sometimes we have this picture that the Catholic Church was great in the 1950s and early 60s, and then Vatican II ruined everything. Yeah. But that's not the case. Okay. And if you if you talk to people from that time period, they'll tell you that. Did you know my mom is from that time period and she says the exact opposite? Oops. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, if, if you can just find yourself a, a non-jaded so old person. Yeah, did you know most old people are jaded? Oh, well, maybe because an old person's jaded, they're going to look back and say, Oh, the time before that was horrible. That's what my grandparents on my dad's side are like and then the grandparents on my mother's side are like no all this stuff is a book is bogus so maybe instead of making oh i talked to one old person there and he hated the uh the old praying in latin and then you're like was this guy wearing pants it was like yes it was a woman and she was 50 pounds overweight and wearing pants and 97 years old oh so she was a liberal okay so, for this next part, we're going to talk about atheistic persecutions here. And Dr. Clueless is going to try to put forward all sorts of funny ideas that, um, I'm not sure where he gets them from. You had issues of persecution, where yeah. you're dealing with it being illegal to be Catholic in these countries. You have basically mm -hmm. positively atheist regimes. Mm -hmm. So Now, I'm going to pause it here for a second, right? So, he's talking about... 1960s apparently he didn't know about the 1920s where uh, my ancestors on my mother's side were being murdered by the mexican government oh, but you know it's a unique thing that there's persecutions 40 years after there were more persecutions you know after the 1800s which were filled with persecutions yeah now we have new persecutions taking place <gasps> um how are we going to deal with this you know um that's part of, that was actually one of the factors behind like Dignitatis Humanae and religious freedom. It wasn't just about freedom in the way, it was about in the East. Like the civil governments have no right to impinge the church's divinely given mandate to mm -hmm. preach the gospel. Like people always think of Dignitatis Humanae as being solely about the individual citizen's freedom from coercion, right? That's part of it. But there's actually a whole, it, it, it does list that out based on human dignity and the nature of man is an obligation to seek the truth and come to know it insofar as it's known. Therefore, he has a right to exercise that mm -hmm. and free from coercion in civil society, meaning secular civil governments have no right to. 
well, well, why didn't the church promulgate this in the second century? It sounds like the church was 1800 years too late to promulgate this to say, hey, you nasty people persecuting us, human rights, freedom, and oh, wait, oh, that's right, it's a purely invention of the fake religion from the uh, Enlightenment. Okay, never mind. Rule mm -hmm. you on this question. Mm. Um, but it also has a, another section that positively affirms the additional right of the church because of its divine mandate. Mm. And therefore, basically, any no government has a right to impinge upon the church's mission. And so any basically any law that would try to do that is not a, a valid law. Mm -hmm. And the, it was asserting its right against all governments. And part of that was because of communism. That was persecuting the church. It was affirming in the face of the advance of communism that those governments have no right to impinge upon the church. So let's take a look at a few things here with our good friend. So Dignitatis Humanae says, quote, a sense of the dignity of the human person has been, has been impressing itself more and more deeply on the consciousness of temporary man. This is uh, Dignitatis Humanae 1, by the way. The, dig the demand is increasingly made that man should act on their own judgment. This is actually very important. Enjoying and making use of a responsible freedom. First, the council professes itself that God himself has made known to mankind the way in which men are able to serve him, thus to be saved in Christ and come to blessedness. We believe that this is the one religion subsists in the Catholic and Apostolic Church, to which the Lord Jesus Christ committed the duty of spreading it abroad men. Truth cannot impose itself, very important, except by virtue of its own truth. Okay. I'm not sure whoever wrote this. <laughs> The truth cannot impose itself except by the imposingness of itself. <laughs> truth cannot impose itself except by virtue of its own truth. Oh, whoa. How else was truth going to impose itself? Truth cannot impose itself except by virtue of a Big Mac and seducing the people with sin. <laughs> The religious freedom in turn, which de men demand as necessary to fulfill their worship to God, has to be done with immunity from coercion in civil society. Therefore, it leaves untouched traditional doctrine on the duty, the moral duty of men and societies towards the true religion and towards the one church of Christ. N number two, from Dignitatis Humani. The, ca the council further declares that the right to religious freedom has its foundation in the very dignity of the human person as his dignity is known through the revealed word of God and by reason itself. This right of the human person to religious freedom can be recognized in the constitutional law whereby society is governed and thus become a civil right. In consequence, the right to this immunity continues to exist even in those who do not live up to their obligation of seeking the truth and adhering to it and exercise this right to not be impeded, for provided that just or just public order is observed. Doesn't sound very wrong, because this is very individualistic, and that's the society we tend to live in. Well, my good friend, the amazing Pope Leo, the amazing Pope Leo the Thirteenth from Immortale Day says, "Quote, paragraph thirty-seven, and of course I'm doing uh, partial quotes." I don't do full quotes because then I would be here all day. I also, my camera's dead, so you didn't get to see me drink lovely coffee. In the same way, the church cannot approve of that liberty which begets a contempt of the most sacred laws of God and casts off obedience to due to lawful authority. That needs to be underlined. For this is not liberty so much as license and is mostly co correctly styled by St. Augustine the liberty of self-ruin, and by the Apostle Peter, the cloak of malice. Whatever tends to uphold honor, manhood, and the equal rights of citizens of all these things, as a monument of past ages bear, the church has always been the originator, the promoter, or the guardian. 
especially with reference to the so-called liberties which are greatly so greatly coveted in these days, all must stand by the judgment of the apostolic see and have the same mind. Let no man be deceived by honest outward appearance of these liberties, but let each one reflect on whence these ha have had their origin, but by what efforts they are everywhere upheld and promoted. So the point that Leo the Thirteenth is making is that the power of the papacy as king, as ruler, abrogates your natural rights as citizens. This is why he says you can't you have a due obedience to lawful authority. The Pope as Pope has lawful authority over you. And that rights actually come from adherence to lawful authority. And that all rights must be judged by the apostolic see. But what Dignitatis Humanae is talking about is that the dignity of the human person transcends the rights of the social order. That is, it denies the legitimacy of the Pope being absolute monarch over the church. That is what Dignitatis Humanae is about. It says, oh, that the church as a um, institution gets to do things. We believe that the one true religion subsists in the Catholic Church, to which Lord Jesus committed the duty of spreading it abroad. Man, that's fine. We have no problem with that. The, what the, we have a problem with is that we, is there's no necessity of submission in Vatican II, which was the, the characteristic of the Pope in traditional Catholicism, that he has the power to bind you. Heck, he has the power to decide what you get to eat. There, that, that's one of the most violent um, anti-individualism things I've ever seen in my entire life. Like, can you imagine that? In today's side day and age, we're over here going like, Hey, what's for breakfast? And you're like, I don't know. The Pope definitely can't tell me. Ha, ha, ha. Too. But now, in, the, in traditional Catholicism, the Pope is actually telling you what you can and can't do with your personal freedom. That's the level of authority the Pope has that Vatican II explicitly pretends does not exist when it asserts that the dignity of the individual is found and is preeminent before society. It makes the individual and then the church instead of the church and then the individual. It flips it on its head. So in this next clip, Pines is going to ask, but what about the heirs of Vatican II? Oh. Um, well, I didn't intend to address anyone specifically, but... Okay, forget it, And, of course, he had to bring up, oh, Taylor Marshall, he, he, he hates Vatican II, or, because, you know, the big WWE, oh, Taylor Marshall, the villain, Pints of the Quine is the good guy. You know, they both work for Satan. That's <laughs> fine. What I, are some? Yeah, oh, yeah, I do have a video about that on my own YouTube channel that I did, like, three years ago. Cool. So people like, can people check can that look out that if they up. want a deep dive. But... I mean, some of the things that people point to are... Um, well, they'll claim there's a sort of religious indifferentism. Right, in which is simply not the case if you read the documents. Mm -hmm. Like, So just take, it, take, for example, another good one to read would be the one on um, ecumenism. Unitatis re integratio. Right. You read the first paragraph of Unitatis Re Integratio and then come back and tell me it's religiously indifferent. Mm. Why don't we take his advice and read the first <clears throat> and read the first part of Re Integratio. Unitatis Re Integratio. Oh, look at that. We have it right here. Oh, look, there's this nice bold part. I wonder what that's about. So let's go. Quote, the restoration of unity among all Christians is one of the principal concerns of the Second Vatican Council. Christ founded one church and one church only. However, therefore, and here comes the negative. Oh, we got to we got to undo everything. This guy, this the clue guy, he reads this with the first sentence. And he's like, oh, Christ founded one church and one church only. See, it's the Catholic Church. See, it's the same thing. Ooh. <laughs> That's how you get your PhD. Just lie. Serve Satan. However, many Christian communions present themselves to men as true inheritors of Christ. Indeed, all profess to be followers of the Lord, but differ in mind and go their different ways, as if Christ himself were divided. Such division openly contradicts the will of Christ, scandalizes the world, and damages the holy cause of preaching the gospel to every creature 
But the Lord of Ages wisely and patiently follows out the plan of grace on our behalf, sinners that we are. In recent times, more than ever, he has been rousing divided Christians to remorse over their division, to a longing for unity. Oh. Everywhere in large numbers have felt everywhere large numbers have felt the impulse of this grace. Bum bum. Bum-bum. And among our separated brethren, there also increases from day to day the movement, fostered by the grace of the Holy Spirit for the restoration of unity among all Christians. This movement for unity is called ecumenical. He said as he piously beat his breast, ecumenical. Oh, yes. Oh, oh. Vatican II. <laughs> Those belong to it who invoke the triune God and confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. Not this, or doing this not merely as individuals, but also corporate bodies. For almost everyone regards the body in which he has heard the gospel as his church and indeed God's church. All, however, though in different ways, long for the one visible church of God, a church truly universal set forth into the world, that the world may be converted to the gospel and to be saved to the glory of God. So let's reread these last two sentences here. Those belong to it who invoke the triune God and confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. Well, that's all the Protestants. Vatican II says explicitly that the majority of Protestants are real members of God's one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Not only as individuals, but also as corporate bodies. That is, there is a Lutheran Catholic church, a Methodist Catholic church, a, I don't know, four square, sixth right angle, 42nd street Baptist Catholic church as well. And then it has this, this quirky line here. Almost everyone regards the body in which he has heard the gospel as his church and indeed God's church. So because people experience the gospel, therefore that's God's church. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's not preaching religious indifferentism. That's the most indifferent thing I've heard in my entire life. So St. Jerome says, quote, God hates the sacrifices of these heretics and pushes them away from himself. And whatever, whenever they come together in the name of the Lord, he abhors their stench and holds his nose. That's not what Vatican II says. Vatican II says, whenever anyone comes together, God happily is there and blesses them. And in the Book of Wisdom, uh, no, I guess it's one of the wisdom books, Ecclesiasticus or Sirach 24. Quote, oops, I gave a sweet smell like cinnamon, an aromatic balm. I yielded a sweet odor like the best myrrh. I perfumed my dwelling as storax and galbanum and onyx and aloes as the frankincense not cut. My odor was as the purest balm. That, end quote, that is how the wisdom of God is, is described. And then Jerome says, you know that Protestant prayer? That is so distasteful to God that he holds his nose. Oh, okay, yeah, it really, really seems like we, we belong to the same religion here. So, no, God, to say publicly that God is happily working through the Protestants is blasphemy. It goes against the Bible, it goes against the entirety of the Catholic tradition, and it also goes against the very nature of the papacy. God works contrary to the will of the Protestants because the Protestants do not wish unity with the church. They wish division. And then there is that famous line from the Council of Florence. The, whoa, and then the camera came back. It firmly believes, professes, and preaches that all those who are outside the Catholic Church, not only pagans, but also Jews and heretics and schismatics, who share not an eternal life, will go into the everlasting fire, which was prepared for the devil and Pope Francis and his angel, <laughs> unless they are to join the Catholic Church before the end of their lives, that, and that the unity of the ecclesiastical body is of such importance that only do those who abide in it do the church's sacraments contribute to salvation 
and do fasts, almsgiving, and other works of piety and, uh, and practices of the Christian militia produce eternal rewards. That nobody can be saved no matter how much he has given away in alms, even if he has shed his blood in the name of Christ, unless he has persevered in the bosom and unity of the Catholic Church. Close quote. And that's Council of Florence, the um, Cantati Domino or something. And that is, um, that is marked with um, ex exceedingly explicit infallibility as well. So the Catholic Church believes itself to be the only holy church. That's what the point is. And the Catholic Church believes it is such the only Catholic Church that even if you give the ultimate sacrifice, if you do not live under the submission to the head of the Catholic Church, who is the state itself, because that's what it means for him to be the Pope. That's why the Christ and the Pope are become one as the head of the church. You have no possibility of salvation. So I would like to offer this next clip as evidence that Dr. DeClue is a literal puppet. He's not a figurative puppet. No, no, no. It's kind of nutty how I, I feel like I learned all of this stuff in college and just like being on YouTube. 10 years ago and this guy's like I'm a doctor I'm breaking some new ground here have you read Michael Davies yet backgrounds in theology but just want a traditional mass tend to look negatively upon Vatican II so do you think that is has to do with what they've heard about the documents yes. or what they think the repercussions were because of the second what they would attribute to the second Vatican Council probably both, both. they yeah. reinforce yeah. each other so what do you think yeah. are some myths about like, what do you see online and you see people say things, you're like, I, I'm sorry, you mustn't have read them. I mean, we've already talked about a couple, but. Right. Um, I mean, one of the ones that still boggles my mind is the all of the arguments about the word subsistent in. The oh, the, for those who do not know, there is this famous passage in Lumen Gentium 8 that is on the level of Protestants uh, faith by works alone. I mean, faith or salvation by faith alone. This is the level of this argument. Um, I'm going to show you the text. Um, you won't believe it. Well, actually, you will because you're probably a Sadie who's watching this, and you'll be like, "Yeah, it does say it, but I'm going to get on, make a joke." <laughs> the phrase okay. subsists in the Catholic Church, yeah. right? The one Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church. Why didn't it just say "is" the way that Mystici Corporis did? Why did they replace it with subsistent in? Mm -hmm. And here's just do a little bit of research and you'll find out why pretty clearly. First of all, subsistent in is used by, I think it was Gregory the Great. It's in the Baltimore Catechism. It uses the term, the church subsists in all ages. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if you use the same word in a different way, that doesn't count. Dumb. I mean, a very smart person, let's be very charitable. This man is a well-groomed and I am not welcome. Therefore, he must be smarter than me. Lumen Gentium 8, quote, The church constituted and organized in the world as a society subsists in the Catholic Church, which is governed by the successors of Peter and the bishops in communion with him. Although many elements of sanctification and of truth are found outside its visible structure, these elements as gifts belonging to the Church of Christ are forces impelling us towards Catholic unity. So according to Lumen Gentium, it's very clear. There is a church, and we've got all the truth inside of the church. And this church is not perfect. This church has holes in it. And the holes have part of all the graces of truth and goodness and sanctification falling out of the church. There's parts of that fall out of the church. So outside the Catholic Church, according to Lumen Gentium 8, there is salvation. That's what this means. Quote, Many elements of sanctification and of truth are found outside its visible structure. So we can go a little further down and realize that um, we're talking explicitly about Protestants. That's the description given. So Lumen Gentium 15. The church rec recognizes in many ways that she is linked with those being baptized are honored with the name of Christian, although they do not profess the faith in its entirety, 
or do not preserve unity of communion with the successor of Peter. The church is linked with baptized people who are heretics and apostates, who are publicly out of the church, who do not call themselves Catholic. The church is linked to them. Only in a natural way is the church linked to them. Like we preserve the Bible and then they stole our Bible, therefore we're linked to them because they stole it. Now, Lumen Gen if, if you actually read Lumen Gentium, it's so clear it's, it's Protestant. that it, it, it baffles the mind that I've ever read this and didn't realize it right away. Let's continue on. For there are many who honor the sacred scripture, taking it as a norm of belief and a pattern of life, and they show sincere zeal. They are consecrated in baptism, in which they are unified with Christ. They also recognize and accept other sacraments within their own churches or ecclesiastical communities. Do you remember that little thing we had a little bit ago at the Council of Florence that it doesn't matter what you do as if you're outside unity with the Pope, you, you're outside? Well, Vatican II says you don't have to have unity with the Pope. It only says you have to have nominal unity. You only have to belong to the same generic religion. So in other words, all Christians are saved in Vatican II. They just don't have the fullness of the truth because their tradition started after our tradition. Okay. Many of them rejoice in the Episcopate and celebrate the Holy Eucharist with cultural and cultivate devotion towards the Blessed Virgin. Well, they also have cultural devotion to the Blessed Virgin as well. They also share with us in prayer and other spiritual benefits. Do you remember where Cantante Domino was saying, um, if you are uh, die for the truth of Jesus Christ, but you're outside the Pope, or, I mean, outside unity with the Pope and the Catholic Church, that it doesn't count for anything? Well, Lumen Gentium 15 wants you to know that they've abrogated that teaching. Because mm -hmm. it's a different religion. They also share with us in prayer and other spiritual benefits. Likewise, we can say that in some real way they are joined with us in the Holy Spirit. For them too, he gives his gifts and graces whereby he is operating among them in his sanctifying power. Yes, God operates through error to make goodness. Does not mean he's willing error. He would have to literally be the God of evil. He would have to be a different God. He, it's, not, it's not like in the Old Testament where God's like, okay, because you sinned, I will allow someone to hurt you. I will deliver you up to the Babylonians. No, no, no. In, in Lumen Gentium, God is working with the Babylonians to save the Babylonian souls by making them go into Israel and obliterating the place. It makes... The, the, it, it, it's, it's incredible. And then here it is. Here it is. Oh, I can, this line needs to be like italicized, underlined, bolded, because this is insane. Indeed, or some indeed, he has strengthened to the extent of shedding their blood. Even if he has shed his blood in the name of Jesus, unless he be preserved in the unity and bosom of the Catholic Church, it doesn't count for nothing. This is Catholicism in red. And this is paganism. I mean, it's it's literally one for one. It's it it it's. Oh, but it's a myth about Vatican II. Yes. Did you know it's a myth? And then, ah, uh, ah. Uh, see, this is explicit proof that Pines with Aquinas is either the biggest hog nose quack man, or else he's just an enemy of all that live. And I wanted to go to the very end because there's like. There were a lot of weird errors in this video that he did here, and it's kind of like, yeah, we, we've gone over this a hundred times. That's my understanding, but I mean, I'll just go out on the limb here. It is my stance that they are in schism, and I don't. So they are in schism, but you don't know the issue, and you're a doctorate who's doing three-hour interview on the topic. Okay. I don't really see another way of canonically and. What's, what's your argument that the SSPX are in schism? Because the definition of schism is refusal to submission to the Roman pontiff or those who are in communion with him. So if you... 
So the definition of schism is refusal to submit to the Roman pontiff or those in communion with him. Um, that would make half of the Novus Ordo Church in schism, by the way. Because a lot of people like Strickland, like Burke, um, even though they're in schism with the actual Church of Jesus Christ, the Catholic Church, they don't accept the heresies coming out of the Germans, right? So either the Germans are in schism with them, or they're in schism over here. Francis is mad at Burke, so I guess Burke is in schism with him. Yeah, I mean, if if we're going to be like this petty about this, half of the Nova Soda Church is in schism with the other half of the Nova Soda Church, and it changes on a monthly basis. The, uh, a, a synod happens, oh man, the entire conservative side of the Nova Soda Church just went into schism. Two months later, they accept whatever is produced from, from the synod. Oh, now we're back in union. Now. Oh, uh, Mueller comes out and says, oh, they're all paid actors. And oh, now he's out in schism. Then two months later, he comes back in. Oh, we're good. It's a clown show. Are refusing to obey his directives or refusing to commune with the bishops under him and you are separately setting up your own tribunals or telling your people that they shouldn't go to even a Latin mass celebrated by the FSSP uh -huh. and definitely never to go to Novus Ordo. Uh -huh. You are refusing communion with the people in communion with the Bishop of Rome. You are outside of the juridical structure. Uh -huh. um, without the, without, so the way that the higher, again, the church is a visible society. You have the Pope, the bishops, the priests, the deacons, right? They all have to have proper mandates to function properly. Here we go back with the mandates again. Everybody's like, yes, you get this little piece of paper, and it, uh, you open up, like, wow, I got all the graces in the world. It's like, uh, it's not exactly how it works, because if that was how it worked, you'd still be in a different religion, because Vatican II blasphemes the, the other ecumenical councils. And that was a mark. If you looked at all the ecumenical councils, they will all say, oh, we have reaffirmed this council. And then Vatican II does it like once in the very beginning opening thing. And it doesn't even mention what it's reaffirming. Um, this is actually, I still believe this is the strongest argument for the Nova Soda religion. But it's desperately misunderstood by them. And Bishop Senran has pointed out that, yeah, we don't have the authority to make marriage tribunals. But the SSPX did which is it's very suspect the sspx are very suspect so if you are ordained validly but you're acting outside of the juridical structure of the church with no mandate in the proper line you are acting schismatically you are doing that which the law does not allow you to do and then Pope Francis came and threw a wrecking ball through this whole narrative, this whole story, and said, oh yeah, you can, for the year of mercy, you can hear all the um, confessions you want, and we'll accept all your marriages. Oh wait, so Francis can just ignore all of the laws and just do whatever he wants? Okay. Unclear to me how the SSPX teach officially, because you'll sometimes see YouTube videos put out on mm -hmm. their channel, you'll sometimes hear a priest say this or that, so is it the case that the SSPX, like, per se, has stated that you should never attend a Novus Ordo Mass? It seems I, to be. I don't know. I've, yeah, one, again, one infamous yeah. SSPX YouTuber <gasps> says he would rather die than mm -hmm. attend the new Mass. And that guy's Kennedy Hall! <laughs> oh, it's always so good to see Pines with Aquinas chipping away on the old block on Kennedy Hall. Now Kennedy Hall's gonna get on that. Ooh! <laughs> All right, so now um, I don't really have notes for this. This is all just initial reaction stuff. I hate that initial reaction stuff. But he now he's going to get on to say the Vicantism. And let's listen very closely for how he doesn't have a clue what we are. Yeah. On a uh, related topic, but different, it seems to me that you have people today who are set of mm -hmm. but they're saying they're not set of No, no, no. I'm very public. I'm a set of I'm like, hi, guys, I'm a set of Right? So he's already not talking about the real settings. He's talking about Father James Altman, uh, maybe not even Vigano anymore. Vigano's recently come out and been like, I'm much more public about it. He's talking about like, almost like Taylor Marshall. He seems like completely obsessed with other YouTube personalities. And look how happy he is. A set of contest. I'm gonna lie about them. 
<laughs> Where's Peter Diamond to do like, do you see the lines? Oh wait, um, do you see the lines coming out of his head, resembling the horns of Satan? This man is truly evil. He, his name is Pints with Aquinas. <laughs> you know that deadpan way Peter Diamond talks. And it's 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 sort of similar thing. It's like, well, here's the definition of schism. Why why what's the problem with this? And you have others today, very well, somewhat prominent priests who have been told not to present themselves as priests, like Altman, mm -hmm. and then other yeah. people who will refuse to accept that they're set of a contest because they say, well, no, a set of a contest means those who deny the papacies since since this pope. Since 1958, when John the 23rd decided that he was going to touch the canon, John the 23rd, who was a noted Freemason who did not believe in the Catholic faith. Oh, that sounds like a really good candidate for someone who's not a real pope. I don't know. How do you get a better candidate than that? Than the next guy, but I mean... <laughs> Yeah, no, it doesn't work that way. But um, just, yeah. just like you did there where you said, okay, well, let's right. look at the definition No, no here. You're, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Like, by definition, if you deny that... The papacy the, of Pope Francis, Pope is you're, Pope, a set of a then you're a set of a Because you believe yeah. the chair is empty. Yeah. Now, you, you're a different kind of set of a... You're like, okay, yeah. well, because, you know, they all go back to a different Pope, right? There's no one unified opinion. There's two opinions, okay? And then there's the weirdos with the Bene Plainists. No one likes those people, and they always claim to be bigger than what they are, and they never talk to anyone. They don't have any presence on social media, except for Patrick Coffin. Wow. In of State of Acontis, on which was the last valid pope. Now, I think the position of State of Acontism is inherently contradictory, because if it were true, then the Catholic faith itself would be false, because how... Because we only have like, you know, 30, 40 bishops running around making priests, you know, sitting on a podcast and complaining about other people saying they better not do what I don't like them to do. You got this guy, if he actually believed, and this is one of the ways that you can tell that these people don't actually believe what they say. If you believed what you said, you'd go to Pennsylvania, you'd go find Bishop Sanborn and you would berate him and try to convince him to stop running a seminary. You go find Pavarunis. You go find the um, Italian uh, lines off of the RCI. You'd go find all the SSPX um, seminaries, and you'd be like, you guys got to stop it. No, they don't care. This is just internet content for them. Oh, all oh, oh, drama in the world. Oh, please. I, I need something to talk about where I don't have to actually present any reasonable arguments or do any work. Oh, they're just all wrong. I'm right. The, uh, Vatican II is a great, didn't didn't say anything bad. Um. Oh, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Every single paragraph could probably be blotted out. And we'll put another clip in, because I was watching further, and this one's amazing. We're going to hear, Pope can turn off a non-infallibility, brah, don't you know? So it sounds like you're saying that the Pope can believe heresy, the Pope can teach heresy. And by teach, I just mean if you're on an airplane and you're saying things, uh -huh. that could be argued to be a form of teaching. I'm telling right. you something that I think is the case. So it sounds like a, an, opin right. a, a, an opinion... Could be yes, yes. Of course, of course, the Pope can believe and teach heresy, just not right. formally bind so the Church to that maybe, heresy. Maybe this is a good analogy. So when Pope Benedict the Sixteenth wrote his Jesus of Nazareth series, he made it clear that he was writing this as a private theologian. Yeah. So let's say you found something heretical. I'm not saying there is anything heretical in there, but let's say you found something heretical in those books. I think the Diamond Brothers did find a lot of heresy in that book. Ju ju just to let you know, it's not magisterial. So. Because this is part of the definition of papal infallibility. That someone who was made pope has been a theologian for 60 years doesn't have a clue what the church actually teaches. Yes. Yes. That, that, that's a normal thing that happens in the Catholic Church. That maybe gets overlooked. It's when the pope is teaching as mm -hmm. chief shepherd of the entire flock. So it's not even when he's teaching as the Bishop of Rome for the Diocese of Rome. It's a new definition of infallibility made up on the spot. If it's not addressed to the entire church, it is not him speaking as the Pope of the entire church. So 
All, all the pups had to do was go, oh, to everybody in the entire church except for that idiot over there. And then all of a sudden, fallibility just doesn't work. Now he can say anything he wants. That would still wouldn't matter. Um, I already pointed out from the Council of Florence that the Second Vatican Council, which is an ecumenical council, denies the very same text. So, you know, it doesn't matter anyway. Specifically when he's enacting his role, because mm. he's got multiple roles, right? He's the Bishop of Rome. He's the, I don't know what the term would be. He's like the primate of the Latin church. Um, and he's the universal shepherd. So when he's acting in the capacity as the universal shepherd and is defining something on faith and morals to be definitively held or believed, then, right? So he can teach in all sorts of manners that are not magisterial in the technical or it, not level of universal magisterium. I don't think he could bind the whole church to even have religious submission of intellect and will to something heretical. And by heretical, we mean contrary to direct divine revelation. Dude, the Pope can change what you eat. He can just be like, uh, I moved this beast day over here. Guess what? Day of fast. I have that much power. And then it's going to like, oh, but eating's not really a matter of faith. I mean, barbecue isn't really a religion. Well, it is in some parts of the world, so that wouldn't be true. But you see, it would only apply in some parts of the world. Oh my goodness. I'll tell you, the enemies of the church, you have to have a PhD in whatever religion he's a part of in order to know what is going on. I have to like look up, look a little thing. Ding, 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 ding. Hey, what, who's this address to? What? Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, am I included in the people addressed? Does it bind me? Oh, it's so silly, man. Hmm. How would you ever overcome it? If, if the voting cardinals are all invalid because they were appointed by a pope who's that's invalid, you could works. never... That's not, that's not how it works. See, the Kasekiachum thesis form in matter... Anyway, I'm, this video is going on way too long, and I don't want to get into the thesis stuff, even though there's some interesting stuff done with it recently. Um, but he, he doesn't even know the argument, right? And this is the thing. When I was an undergraduate, I was stupid. I was like this person. I was very stupid. I only read what I wanted to read, and I didn't read anything that, of, of the opposing side. You cannot bring up the argument of how would we have valid bishops to elect the next pope. Pope Pius XII changed the rules so that bishops who were in, in a suspended or even possibly heretical but as long as they had apostolic lineage were allowed to vote. Technically speaking, that's the rule still in effect. So, no, Pope Pius XII, moved by the Holy Spirit, enabled Sadovacantism to exist. So it's like, oh, wow, well, you got to go back and read, teach everybody everything. And at this point, I would like to say thank you so much for watching this. If you got this far, I am praying for you, for all my dear viewers. And man, why are, they, are all our enemies so dumb? I'd love to learn something from watching these people, but all I get is is a, is a chore, for, and I have to do extra work because doctorates and PhDs are dumb.